one of Nigeria's most prominent voices has called and has been calling on President Goodluck Jonathan to step up to the plate. And he, of course, is the internationally renowned Nobel laureate Wole Soinka, often called the conscience of the nation. He joins me right now here in the studio. Mr. Soinka, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. You heard that leader of Boko Haram say the most outrageous things. By Allah, I have the right to sell these girls into slavery. There's a market for them. Western education must be, must be taken out of this country. What do you make of what's going on in your country right now? Uh, it's a situation which has been left to fester. It was addressed very late and very cursorily, very lackadaisically. And now it's become uh, not just a national, national problem, but a West African problem, because it's a force which destabilizes the entire uh, nation. Do you think it's a good thing, and should your president accept the offer of help that the United States is giving, military personnel, hostage negotiation, experts, all sorts of uh, advice and probably materiel on, on surveillance and other such things? President Jonathan, should have asked for it from the very beginning. I, I don't believe in false pride. Uh, the history of the movement which, uh, to which Boko Haram belongs, of which it is a part, that tendency, that quote-unquote, if you like, uh, philosophy, is one which is a menace to the entire world. It's not a Nigerian affair alone. So uh, there should be no hesitation. I, I approve of the language of the president. Why do you think they have hesitated? Look, it was you who called for the president to confront this and speak to the nation, address the nation. You did that last week. Only this weekend did he follow your advice and actually spoke to the nation. Why has he been, in your words, in denial? It's not only he. It's the advisers around him. It's a certain section of the nation uh, some of whom uh, enjoy, for various reasons, a nation in a state of chaos. They profit by it, and in fact, some of them are guilty of provoking the situation. So it's a measure of guilt and also a measure of, uh, of gloating that uh, the governance of the nation is in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. So it's a mixture of motivations. The person who has no excuse is the president of the nation. I want to bring up some things that we've been watching. For instance, we've been watching these demonstrations by the, by the parents inside Nigeria, plus many, many concerned activists and citizens. We've seen these demonstrations now spread to, to Washington, London and elsewhere. But we've also heard from a father and some parents of these children who, would, who were abducted three weeks ago. I want to play you what one of the fathers told CNN by phone shortly after the kids were kidnapped. Well, do you know what? We don't have that. But what he was saying was, we know that had the government moved quicker, they could have rescued our girls. Why do you... Th what is going on? He says, you know, the government doesn't care, quote, about the poor people of this country. Uh, you know, I probably have more questions than you have. Uh, for instance, I'd like to know why we are not allowed to see the faces, the humanity of these girls who have been abducted. Mm -hmm. Why is it that their pictures are not on the pages of the newspaper? Well, why isn't it? The, why aren't they? I told you, I have more questions than you have. But is that a government restriction? It's, a gov it's obviously a government restriction. This is a government which is not only in denial mentally, but is in denial about certain obvious steps to take. It's, it's, it's one of those other childlike situations that if you shut your eyes, if you don't exhibit, you know, the tactile evidence of the missing humanity here, that somehow the problem will go away. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an attitude which exists in the subconscious, even though it's not admitted. Let me play this poor father's sad comments to CNN. Yes. They have a joint attitude concerning the poor people in the nation. Had it been the government of taking any measure, I believe they would have to restore our daughter. They waited until after 11 days, they have transferred them somewhere else. We parents, we don't know where our daughters are now. You know, when, when you hear his voice, and we just spoke about it, it really is, does it make you feel sad? It, it, it's angry, it's really agonizing, really agonizing. It's something which I never thought 
even though I've been warning for years, it's not, you know, for years about this menace, when it eventually escalates to this level, it's astonishing how one still feels, you know, literally eviscerated by the abduction of these girls. You are a Nobel laureate, yet I have said that you are the voice of a nation, maybe even a, a, a continent and a conscience as well. Why is it that you've been warning, and what exactly have you been warning about that hasn't been dealt well, with? I've been warning especially that the pinpricks of this movement uh, are not confined to Nigeria, mm -hmm. and that it should be recognized. Those who understand the history of Algeria, for instance, those who saw the career of the, uh, of the Taliban when they overrun Afghanistan, those who kind of delude themselves that people are going to Somalia to be trained with Al-Shabaab, etc., etc. Those who are conscious of what is happening in the rest of the world should have known five years ago. And they have been warned publicly. I've said it in lectures that the pinpricks you're seeing all over the world are consolidating into a situation of internal war, insurrection by this group. What will that mean for Nigeria? You are, after all, the most powerful economy in Africa, but there is terrible corruption. A lot of the oil wealth is siphoned off right, at the, right as it comes out of the ground. What does all of this mean for Nigeria? Are you worried about it? Oh, very much so, very much so. And uh, the, when we even talk about corruption, there's a need to specify uh, also, because this revolt, if you like, this <laughs> insurrection or whatever, began in a certain section of the country. And it indicates what has been happening to what eventually became the foot soldiers, the, the despairing uh, Almajiri, for instance, who've been under the thumb of the um, militant uh, mullahs and who brainwashed thousands of these kids who are foot soldiers. They're the ones who, who cannot think for themselves any longer. And those who started this movement, those who started, in fact, their soldiers are turning against them. They're out of control. Mm -hmm. The politicians who use that toxic brew of religion and politics to try and destabilize the nation, they are asking for help. Because those on the jury who've trained elsewhere, who become radicalized even more than their handlers understand that they are totally out of control. Mm -hmm. And they're on the first line of the victims. You call for the government and the nation has called for the government to take action against Boko mm. Haram. But, and I want to quote you something that the United States Special Envoy said mm. last year when I interviewed him about this. Mm. He talked about the backlash because of government actions. He basically said, we have received numerous reports of mass arrests, extrajudicial killings, torture and prolonged detention without due process. Many Nigerians believe that the excessive use of force by security forces has alienated local populations and fueled support for Boko Haram. So, on the one hand, you and others are calling on the government to get this in, in hand. On the other hand, a lot of backlash is being created by the way their scorched earth policy seems to be progressing. I'm calling now not just for the nation to take action. I'm calling for the international community, the United Nations. This is a problem. This is a global problem. And a foothold, you know, is being very deeply entrenched in West Africa. If, for instance, Nigeria, with the assistance of France, had not moved into Mali, and fortunately, this is one of the advices which this government eventually took, that don't wait for Mali to come to Nigeria, go into Mali and stop them where they are. And France took the lead, we followed immediately in Nigeria, and ECOWAS followed. So it's not a Nigerian problem alone. Now, when people talk about um, corruption... And that was, of course, when Al-Qaeda in Al the Islamic Maghreb Al tried to Al-Qaeda moved in, That's and right. Boko Haram was going to Mali to train, to refresh, to re-equip. And if Mali had stayed in the hands of Al-Qaeda, uh, <clears throat> it's a very different story. Right. The other thing I want to say is this. It's part of the denial when certain, when fingers are pointed at certain events in the country without going back to understand how this happened. I'm talking about extrajudicial killing, for instance. It is wrong, it is condemnable, and we condemned it. But to say that because the leader of the original Boko Haram 
was extrajudicially executed, that that is why there is now this upsurge, this is climactic uh, action. This is part of the self-denial, the denial of the real situation. This Yusuf was a killer, a butcher. He should never have been extrajudicially killed, I agree. But this event, this revolt started long before the extrajudicial killing. And the man that they're trying to turn into a saint now was just a homicidal maniac who killed non Muslims, you know, at the snap of a finger, kill families and force people to convert or give them a choice, convert or you'll be killed. Now today I read about, you know, this Yusuf uh, as if he was a saint and it's only because, and people have the wrong kind of self-deluding piety. Oh, if only he had not been touched. This is nonsense and the world is being deceived.